and at that time people used to always think that pediatric endocrinology is one branch which is basically very very rare dealing with rare complicated disorders which require cumbersome evaluation and expensive treatment this was a common thing everybody used to say what will pediatric endocrinology do nothing much to be done at this year but when we started seeing patients we were shocked by the way they were being managed and this is one case with dr rashmi and both of us managed it was a very short child diagnosed in 10 years with severe anemia presented for the first time and then at that point of time there was a short stature and was given a blood transfusion diagnosed as a case of celiac disease but unfortunately had developed hiv because of the blood transfusion which happened in that scenario so this was the unfortunate scenario a case which should have been diagnosed at the right time and should have been managed in that perspective always in that scenario so we thought what are the problem is it a problem of awareness accessibility or affordability now everybody says it is always a problem of cost so people say cost is a major problem but what is the truth is actually the elephant of the house is awareness if you don't know when should you go where should you go how you should be managed it is difficult once you go direction is there people will help you people will help the patient patient will help themselves but most important is awareness so from there we started our program and 2012 we had the first ppec and lot of people here including all the seniors dr subrato dr rishi everybody was part of that program and since then we have conducted huge number of programs across the region in the country but unfortunately how many physical programs one can do that is a limit to that so we started the advanced programs as well so we move forward from there to internet media because now internet is available so we started on youtube around 7 years ago and from there we move forward towards a structured program both on site as well as online and now we have got the application and other things which are happening we have e learning program which has got huge number of subscribers and all of you would have access that this would be something to go forward but problem with uh, youtube is that you can see one video and then you forget about it so if you want to have a systematic learning we started off with this program of medi classes 4 years ago in which we now have a fellowship program and a diploma program a lot of programs are there a lot of people are part of that program as well now we also run regular post graduate fellow classes and the publications and applications are there applications are going to make very easy day to day management in that regards the often problem still remains is that the number of pediatric endocrinologists in the country may be around 100 and 100 may be a over rating exaggeration cases are thousands so what do we need to do there needs to be a bridge between cases pediatricians and pediatricians with special interest and then more pediatric endocrinologists this is what we are looking at for that now we are trying to come up with a solution which hopefully will come up in the next 2 to 3 months which will help you out using a personalized intelligent emr so what it will do is that based upon your particular problem so if a child has short stature once you say short stature specific questions will come with regards to history examination this will be there for all conditions so precocious puberty delayed puberty dsd whatever 40 conditions we are developing these protocols you just have to enter this data once you enter you will ask specific questions on examination so for a delayed puberty it will ask anosmia for precocious puberty it will ask about headache so different questions will come once you answer those questions put basic data while you are examining the patient this is looking very benign simple you are just putting but what is and you may simultaneously assess bone age there so it looks very simple you are doing that but what is happening is that behind the scene algorithms are running which are then telling you this is the diagnosis this is the investigations required this is the likely treatment and then you will get a lot of output and you can then export it in the form of a proper it will give you like a proper history has been taken you will get results interpretation this is a work in progress lot of intelligent algorithms required it will take time but this is the way forward so this will allow everywhere across the country to have a state of the art quality assured sort of a management and then there could be connections with clinics as well so this is something which we are working in that direction last three days we had very intense program in the regency center for diabetes and technology and research over 30 people from across the country had come and it was a very good interaction with over 300 cases in which a lot of interactive discussion you know have you seen uh, uh, professional uh, live show orchestra 
and you have seen karaoke's also. So what happens in a karaoke is you have a fixed beat and the singer has to sing with that beat. Whereas in a live orchestra, the singer can sing whatever the orchestra has to perform. So basal bolus is the orchestra. It revolves around the food, it revolves around the sugar. Many parents will say, breakfast come khana hai, dinner mein dawat hai. No problem, eat less for breakfast, take less insulin. Because the insulin will basically revolve around the food. So anyway, I'm actually going to take this opportunity to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about the history. I'm sure all of you are aware, just a refresher, because as we go on to newer technologies, the newer, you know, path breaking information, sometimes it is good to revert back to history and see how all this care evolved. Uh, this is a favorite uh, saying from Bertrand Russell. And, you know, so this is in 2019. We had a wonderful program. Some of you may have been there. And you know what? This was a way to get the mantra of pediatric and technology across the East. Now, I want to, I'm sure all of you know, but I just want to reiterate that the earliest records of diabetes mellitus is, was in 1500 BC in the Ebers papyrus. And the Egyptian physician described a disease associated with the passage of much urine. In first century AD, the word diabetes, which means Greek, is siphon. And Eretius noted that patients with diabetes had a disease that seemed to result in a siphoning of the structural components of the body into urine, a melting down of the flesh and limbs into urine. And only in 1674 AD, Thomas Willis, a physician, compares the sweetness of diabetes associated urine to honey. And mellitus in Latin means sweetened with honey. Anyway, this is the timeline as Dr. Chetan very elegantly talked about insulins. The origin was in 1920, exactly 100 years ago. And it was, you know, discovered. And Marjorie, the dog, got better. And that was when the modern era of insulin started. But it lingered on for a long time till the BCCP study uh, came around in 1993. And it was published in NEJ. And over the same time, I was in the United States during my fellowship in uh, Cincinnati. And HbA1c was hailed as the gold standard. And what they showed, the worse is the HbA1c, worse is the microangiopathic complications. And the UK PDA study in 1998 on type 2s also basically mirrored the same thing. The worse the control, the worse the micro and macro angiopathic complications. So these are some objective numbers. In, in DCCD study, when they found they lowered from 9 to 7%, the retinopathy decreased by 63%, nephropathy by 54%, neuropathy by 60% and macrovascular disease by 41%. There's another study, the poor motor study, which happened in Japan, which also mirrored the same findings. So these are the <clears throat> diagnostic criteria. HbA1c added the list in 2020 by the American Diabetic Association equal to and more than 6.5, but it should be a certified laboratory. And that's why that session on analytics earlier today was so brilliant because labs vary, techniques vary, and sometimes our interpretation should be cautious. But now the question is, is HbA1c still the gold standard? Now, are all HbA1c values created equal? With this rock and roll, A1c is 8%. But you see, this blood sugar profile is also 8%. So an average of the last three months blood sugar, which gives you 8%, may be, may be erroneously reassuring you. Of course, the gold standard now is 7%, which you all know. So A1C does not tell the whole story. A1C does not track glycemic excursion. 60% of lows may not be revealed by SMBG alone. CGM identifies four times more serious glucose excursion than SMBG. 
And this is a very interesting cartoon. If I stand with one foot in a bucket of ice water and one foot in a bucket of boiling water, on average, I'm comfortable. So this is HbA1c, I'm sorry to say. So anyway, there are a lot of limitations. I am not going to, for interests of time, I'm not going to go into the minutiae. You can take a pick of that, but I'm, if you're aware and know, then we'll move on. So then CGMS is the game changer. Why? Because it is the movie. It shows the entire movie delivering information in between finger sticks. So you see this. It records glucose readings every 10 seconds and displays them every five minutes. And now, as you know, there are different kinds of CGM. We have now the Abbott Libre, which has come up upon us in the last uh, couple of years, where real time you can measure and it essentially, you can record it. The Libre Pro, there was a lag of 15 minutes for the Libre, they say it's real time. And with the reader, you can keep looking if you want to. Now look at this. Here, there were, these are all, you know, these are all, if you see the dots, those dots are SMBG numbers. But you see how many excursions are there above and below that. The only the CGMS picks it. It provides visibility into the overnight period. But CGM is not only novel, but it can improve the lives of patients. So was the AAC statement in 2010. The advanced technology and treatment for diabetes basically showed that using CGM, you increase time and range. And the SPA-ISPAD recommendation for patient selection, patients who are doing frequent blood glucose testing, patients who have severe hypoglycemic episodes, hypoglycemia unawareness, nocturnal hypoglycemia, wide glucose excursion regardless of HbA1c, and patients with T1D and HbA1c levels below 7% because you may be worried they are having hypoglycemia. And one other indication which is not written in these is that you have, a lot of you would have encountered, A1c, A1c, 10, SMBG, all numbers between 180 to 130. And you do a CGMS and you find that the sugars are all 400. So what's going on? The A1C is clearly real. So even the SMBG, you cannot, you know. So then you go and see this patient has been squeezing the fingers such that a lot of capillary fluid comes out and those sugars are SMBG or CG is spuriously low. So that is one indication. The other indication is, so that is you're getting normal values on the glucose diary, but HbA1c is high. CGM banta hai. And the only problem with uh, Libre is expensive. So if the Abbott people are here, we should try and see how we can get the cost down. So anyway, the gold standard now is 7%. And except for those children who have hypoglycemia, unawareness, are challenged, et cetera, don't have access to local uh, care, there we can lower the A1C to 7.5%. Now, TIR is the emerging metric. So it is 70 to 180. That is the TIR. 70 to 180 is time in range. Less than 70 is level one hypoglycemia. Less than 54 is level two hypoglycemia. More than 180 is level one hyperglycemia and level two is more than 250. And DK of course is the last step. And similarly in hypoglycemia, somebody having severe hypoglycemia is level three. So this is a, you know, it's a very interesting concept of a time in range and time out of range. The more you go away from this, and that green octagon is basically the time in range. Anything outside that is out of range. And look at this, uh, a real ambulatory glucose profile of a given patient. And you see how skewed this is. Uh, time in range is only 47%. And, and high, that is level one, hyperglycemia, 23%. And very high, 
This is not what you want. So the differences we have spoken about, and I'm not going to necessarily, you know, it is obvious that this CGM is a real time thing. You are watching it. And with this Libre now, or even the Medtronic, you know, uh, sensor, if you are linked to one of their state of art, art pumps, you can see this real time. So there is no doubt that time in range is superior. Now, it is interesting to know the relationship between PIR and A1C in type one diabetes. So if you want an A1C to be 7%, which is the goal, you 70% of the time your TIR, which is from 70 to 180, should be in range. Now, this is very interesting that if you made the time in range 70 to 140, then, you know, if we're 70% in there, then 6% would be the A1C. In any case, now, conventionally across the world, especially with the ATTD group, it is concerned time in range is 70 to 180, 70 to 180, which will give you an A1C of 7%. And the, for every absolute 10% change in percentage TIR, 0.8% change in A1C. And interesting in the DC study in 1993 publication in NEJ, they were smart enough to have conceptualized a form of TIR. And what they did actually was they, they did seven point glucose profile for one week, every three months on those patients. And they found the better the control. So they had seven points and that constituted their, you know, a modern day CGM, if you will. And they found that those with the best time in range had the lowest angiopathic complication, microangiopathy. So, you know, this is, so illustrative that if you have 50% uh, your time in range is 50%, then the chances of microangiopathy complication is lowered to 3%, 2%. And that is the power of the time in range. And look at this other panel, when time in range is less than 10%, retinopathy is 58%. And here, the frequency of microalbuminuria is 27%. And when it is 70%, the results are even better. Now, very quickly, I want to shift to another uh, important aspect. We all grew up looking at hypoglycemia as a major, major problem in type 1 diabetics. But over the last four or five years, there is, ever since they've been doing the time in ranges, the CGMSs, and they found that cognition and type 1 diabetes in children and adults, exposure to hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, and diabetic ketoacidosis, what they found is that there is a lower cognitive performance in children who have a poor metabolic control. And what was interesting, these are most sophisticated studies which showed that the alteration in white matter structure in children with type 1 diabetes, they found there was no significant difference in white matter structure between children with hypoglycemia in type 1 diabetics. And this is a little advanced the fractional anisotropy, uh, the FA by tensor imaging. These are basically serial MRIs and you have fractional anisotropy and the concept called axial diffusivity. So the worse the sugar control, the worse the fractional anisotropy, the worse the sugar control, more the axial diffusivity. And what happens is when you have increasing axial diffusibility and decreasing uh, fractional anisotropy, you will find that there is a decrease.
both in the performance and full scale IQ. And persistence of abnormalities in white matter in children with type 1 diabetes. And they found more hyperglycemia, worse cognition. And conclusion of a single episode of moderate severe decay in young children at diagnosis is associated with lower cognitive scores and altered brain growth. I want to stop here by saying that when I was in training, we didn't want hypoglycemia. We didn't care about uh, 250, 300 blood sugars. And when those parents would say their head buzzes when the sugar goes over 300, we used to think, you know, it's probably a figment of the child's imagination. How ignorant we were. But this world has changed to this new paradigm only in the last decade. And let me tell you, there's one message I want to leave with you, especially these young children. Don't just concentrate on hypoglycemia, which is bad. A persistent hypoglycemia can cause you parito-occipital damage. We're all aware of that, especially in those small children with other causes of hypoglycemia, refractory hypoglycemia. But do not ignore hyperglycemia. So this is the most important slide. Any hyperglycemia, cognitive impairment. So low is bad, high is worse. So what is the TIR target? So they had lots of meetings and they're continuously having meetings, they're especially the ATTD group. And what they have said, this is the, and this is a picture you can take if you don't have, and it says that time in range should be 70%, level one hyperglycemia, 25% acceptable, and 5% when is level two. And hypoglycemia is level one, 4%, and level two, less than 1%. So the mantra is the better the time in range, better is the control, and you can keep in a narrow band so there's no hypo or hyperglycemia, and that is best for the cognition of the child. So technology has helped, and in fact, as you're all aware, the 780G is now among us, which essentially causes autobolus corrections. It alters the basal, and it is uh, now in the market, and I'm sure the Medtronic people there because they are the pioneers will have something to say about it. But the important thing is the only breakthrough going forward is not stem cell transplant. It's still in the infancy. It's not giving the you know, beta cell transplant or pancreatic transplant. The reason is they've all been proven wrong in the sense they all fizzle out. So you're left with only the super sophisticated pumps which will be the artificial pancreas for tomorrow. So summary messages, CGMS is now a globally recommended tool. HbA1c has its pitfalls. We still have to work with it. It gives us a lot of cumulative information. TIR or time in range, the new paradigm in type one DM management, 70% CBS between 70 to 180%, which equals to A1c of 7%. Time out of range is associated with neurocognitive impairment. Hyperglycemia causes worse white matter damage and cognitive impairment, so beware. Maintaining glycemic excursions within time and range will prevent both microangiopathic and neurocognitive complications. Uh, this is a picture taken a few years ago with my little type 1 diabetics on World Diabetes Day. Yeah, that's one thing if you guys are not doing in your center, World Diabetes Day. You have to observe, you have to, you know, what do they call that? You have to thrust yourself into the system where you are. Start with the World Diabetes Day. Thank you, Anurag, for the opportunity. And thank you, the chair, for the permission to speak. Thanks, Dada, for the wonderful talk. Uh, first questions for the chair or comments. Thank you, Dada. Uh, we, we, we have seen a paradigm shift in the glucose control paradigms from the triad of fasting, sports planning, and AMNC. We have moved on to the frame chart of where you add on minimal hypoglycemia. Uh, hypo you get a CGM done, you got, get all the information in a 14 day So you have achieved all the targets. 
So to my mind also CGM, particularly in type 1 diabetes, is one of the most important things and they should be uh, real time CGM is the right thing for them to do. Thank you. Okay. So I think this was a very, very clear message that you gave the time above range is also something you have to worry about. It's not just hypo, hyper is also important. Thank you.